Today's reading will be from um, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. So for the last months, as we've been going through scripture, we've talked about the importance of context, right? So I want to make sure we're giving proper context to our story today. Rather than make you read all of chapter one, because I like Jessica too much for that, and attention spans are way too short to read the beginning of the text. I'll give you just a little feel for what comes beforehand. It's the genealogy of Jesus. So what I will do is I'll start reading through it. When you all are done, just wave hands. Or if I start to see heads bobbing in sleepiness, I, I will know you're done. Are you ready? The first few are easy because we actually have done sermons on these over the last six months. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And some of you are thinking, Judah, well, why did we hear that long story about Joseph then? It was a better story. Judah, then we get Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram, y'all are gone. Poor Brittany's like leaning on an arm trying to stay in there. Genealogies just wear you out, don't they? I had a friend who suggested we do an entire camp curriculum based on the genealogy of Jesus because there's so many important characters. And it's like, yes, but can you imagine eight-year-olds trying to make it through the opening scripture? We would have lost them for the week even before someone put a tent stake through someone's head or somebody rescued somebody from sudden doom. You get into all the good Old Testament drama stories. As you go through this genealogy, we hit a few names we know. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. And that's the one that matters to Matthew. Because Matthew's telling us this to connect us to Abraham, to King David, to Joseph. Along the way, we get other names like Solomon and Hezekiah. And then we get a whole other third of the list of names you've never heard of before. And then another familiar name, a Jacob. Another Jacob in the lineage who happens to have a son named Joseph. What are the odds? This son, Joseph, was not spoiled, favored with a rainbow-colored coat like the story in Genesis, but a carpenter. Now, why did we need this background? One, we needed to prove to you your minister could read difficult names, show you what that master's degree is for. The other is to set the stage to understand a little bit of what Joseph's going through, to set a little of the context. So bear with me here, okay? Joseph is not a poor man. He is an established carpenter. He's a part of the community. He would have been educated enough to manage business. He would have been apprenticed in, learned his craft, and been a valuable part of the community. Joseph's not a rich man either. He's a tradesman, not part of the power structure. 
Joseph seems to be living a very traditional life and as such has just taken a young wife. Now, engagement in their day was different. As soon as you were engaged, there was a lifelong commitment. It wasn't like just giving a ring and putting a date on the calendar. If something happened to Joseph, Mary was already considered a widow. At this point, commitments have been made. And Joseph seemed to be a very good person because somewhere along the way, he's confronted with bad news that Mary is with child. And as an upstanding Jewish man following the laws of engagement and marriage, they have not been alone together in a room. They will always have had a supervisor, a sponsor, or been in public view. If they were together one-on-one, -on -one, there was a witness in the room watching across the room. Joseph seems to be a very good person because despite the commitments made, despite the opportunity for a way out, he doesn't take it. He looks for another way, which is a trait we will see in Jesus over the years. More on that in some January sermons. Joseph seems to be a very good person, very traditional, very faithful person. So imagine the frustration in the scenario that presents itself. His wife-to-be is pregnant, and it's not his child. That's enough to start wars. We've watched Game of Thrones, right? We've watched history. One illegitimate child can wreck a community, a family, a genealogy. Or in the Old Testament days, it's called business as usual in the house of David. But for someone without power, someone without privilege, this is world changing. And then we find out the wife to be who is pregnant has a holy child. Well, this is enough to confuse anyone. Just a vision from God, much less one in reference to a potential public scandal that you're about to endure, would be enough to rock our world, right? An angel at night's going to send any of us for a loop for a while. His wife will be pregnant before the wedding. She'll be visible. It's going to be scandal and it's going to be public. Imagine the roller coaster. She's pregnant. Oh, no. She's pregnant. Oh, yay. Everyone's going to know. Oh, no. The child will be an object of gossip. Always. Not everybody got the word from the Lord. And how many times did somebody do something that sounded ridiculous and they said, don't worry, it's all right. God told me it's okay. An angel came last night and told me. Yes, thank you. We're still going to gossip. Thank you very much. Then there had to be the awkward question that Joseph had to be asking himself. Not just what's happening in the community. Internally, he has to be going through the questions, right? Is this the life I want? What happened? I did all the right things. I did everything like I was supposed to. Can I really do this? Why me? Why me? And that last one, that last one's why we went through the genealogy. If it mattered enough for Matthew to write it, and Matthew's primarily writing to a Jewish audience. Luke tends to write to a Gentile audience. Matthew to more of a Jewish audience. If it matters to Matthew enough to include Joseph's heritage, Joseph would also have known his heritage. Joseph has to know the answer to this. He has to be thinking, I am here because I can trace my lineage to David. That's why I'm here. But he also is smart enough to be thinking, why does it matter? I'm not the father. Why do we care? Why even put Joseph's lineage in there if she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit? Practically, it's the lineage of the kings. And kings don't have to be by blood. It can be my marriage. Again, we've watched Game of Thrones. We know this. But for, for Joseph, do you think that really matters? Can't you imagine Joseph asking the question, all of this, all of this struggle, 
all the judgment, all the shame that will come from the community for a child that's not mine? If the real world threats to Joseph's family, if the real world threats to his sanity are not enough, we get this existential layer when we really think about it. We get these questions of cause and purpose that had to keep Joseph up at night. Some of us can relate to Joseph on the issue of marginalization. They will soon be refugees. They will soon be living as aliens in a strange land. Then they will come back to a community where they are considered a pariah. Some of us can relate to Joseph on the issues of duty and being overwhelmed with responsibility. Some of us can relate to, relate to Joseph up all night, pondering issues of purpose and the nature of reality. All of us can relate to Joseph in the desire to find peace in the midst of this chaos, peace in the midst of nightmares. Sometimes finding peace requires stepping back and letting go of control. Sometimes finding peace requires re-examining our own expectations, our own assumptions. Sometimes it calls us to seek forgiveness or to offer grace. Sometimes it calls us to swallow our pride or sacrifice for something bigger. But late at night, in the swirling of our mind, in our worries, in our questions, our doubts, and our fears, there's often no simple cure for chaos. No simple cure for the chaos. Late at night in the swirling of his mind, it's not hard to imagine Joseph's prayer sounding more like a raging storm than a peaceful petition to God. Can you imagine? Are you serious, God? Is this really what doing the right thing gets me? Am I nothing more than a political shield? A genealogical cover story for a miracle that's too big for people to believe? Late at night, in the swirling of our minds, what are your questions? What are your confusions? What's the purpose that you ponder? What's the direction you've debated? What's the place in this world that you have wondered? Why me? We all have our search for peace within us. And we all collectively together have a mission to create peace among us, among us all. Jesus is sometimes called the Prince of Peace, yet we know Jesus' life was chaotic. Not just Jesus' life, before his birth. The announcement of his birth creates chaos, not peace. Jesus' death creates chaos, not peace. And his teachings constantly upset the power dynamics of the day. He created chaos wherever he went. Jesus should be seen as the king of chaos, not the prince of peace. While we call Jesus Prince of Peace, that doesn't mean that Jesus just hands it to us. It doesn't mean Jesus is doling it out like the guy in the ice cream truck, ringing a bell and playing a song for us to follow like mice along to the Pied Piper. It's not ring, 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 here's your peace, take it and go. No. It's not come get your peace on a stick and a cup. Come get your peace with sprinkles on top. It's not the warm, fuzzy stuff. Our Prince of Peace turns things upside down, invites us to strip ourselves of our status, of our privilege, of our security, of our certainty. The Prince of Peace invites us into the chaos, into the mysteries of the world, and then ask ourselves, and we hear Jesus asking, are you okay? 
without all this, without your status, without your privilege, without the expectations of others that have been handed to you, the labels that have been placed upon you, without the identity that you have clung to, when we strip away all the things the world has placed upon you, are you okay? Because that is peace within. To be okay with who you are and to know that you are enough. You are good enough and you are lovable. Without the successes, without the merit badges, without the check marks on the to-do list, you are good enough. You are lovable. It's the message that's echoed throughout the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus echoes in all his teachings. You are enough. Quit trying to meet the world's standards and simply love God, yourself, and your neighbor because you are worthy of love and you are capable of giving love. You are enough. But it's those questions at night of, am I enough? There's a new movie out for Christmas with Will Ferrell where he's not an elf. Instead, he is a spirit of Christmas, and I will try not to give any spoilers. But he and Ryan Reynolds together explore the concept. And some of you are going, Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds, it's funny and good looking. It is. They explore the question of, am I redeemable? Is there such a thing as an unredeemable person? And have I, can I ever do enough good to be redeemed? And that has to be the question Joseph's asking. Was I not good enough? Did I not do enough? Heaven forbid he see the blessing he's being given. All he's getting challenges for him. He's been given chaos. But can he step away from it and see, I am good enough to be a part of this, to be a part of this blessing? I am good enough to come through this and be enough without the community's opinion. Are we good enough? Do we believe we are redeemable enough from the mistakes we've made that we will allow ourselves to be loved and lovable going forward? Or will we continue to isolate and hide ourselves from the world? Do we believe we are good enough to step into the roles of leadership, of advocacy, to be a voice, to be heard by others, to be loved? Or will we consider ourselves unlovable? Well, the conflict and the chaos within, the expectations we feel like we've not met, the disappointments that we may have been in the past, or the not good enough we may have felt for the little we've done, all the things we tell ourselves are not enough, or will we strip it all away and hear the gospel message? God loves you, and you are enough. To find the Prince of Peace, we don't have to follow the ringing of the bells, whether it be an ice cream truck or church towers. Instead, we have to turn within and see the chaos that is there. We have to face the image in the mirror. And when we can find peace there, when we find peace in our hearts, we won't be overwhelmed with the pressures of the world because no matter where we are, we're okay. We won't be overwhelmed with the responsibility of representing our entire community because we're the only one on a mental health spectrum in the room. We won't be overwhelmed with the responsibility of speaking for the culture when we're the only one of that culture to speak. We won't be overwhelmed thinking I'm the only advocate for my LGBTQ plus siblings in the room. I have to speak. The pressure of it, the chaos of it can be overwhelming unless we're already okay. We won't be overwhelmed with the headlines in the news because whatever happens is okay. We are enough. We are lovable. We won't be overwhelmed by the work on our shoulders or be upset when we set the work aside to care for ourselves. We won't be overwhelmed by the chaos because we know God meets us in it. We know who we are is good enough. No matter our status, our genealogy, our celebrity, or our emotional stability in the moment, God meets us where we are. And who you are is good enough. Who you are is good enough to meet the chaos 
in the night and to bring us peace in the nightmares. Amen. Thank you.